Today is May 28, 2014, and we are interviewing John Caristo at the Illinois Veterans Home, Quincy, Illinois. John is 78 years of age, having been born on December 2, 1935. My name is Tracy Allgilbers, and I'll be the interviewer. John, could you state for the recording what war and branch of service you served in? I went in just at the end of the Korean War. I was in the United States Air Force. What was your rank? Airman second class. Airman second class? Yes. Okay. Where did you did you serve? Uh, I went to first it was Samson Air Force Base in New York. Then it went to Francis E. Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Then to Tula Air Force Base in Greenland. And then to San Antonio, Lacan Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, Texas? Okay. While you were in all those places, did you get immersed or involved in the culture where you were stationed? Well, we, we met the different people from like the different states, and their cultures were different, but it was all the same. They were all looking for the same thing, you know, happy families, you know, mm -hmm. and content. And they just went about it in different ways, you know. They had different different ways of doing it. Just like uh, our parents, you know, they all came from different countries. They all had different methods of doing things, different programs, but they all had the same thing in mind. Mm -hmm. Happy families, you know, contained families. Okay. Did you bring any mementos or souvenirs back with you? Memories. Uh, a lot of the memories of the people I met, uh, memories of the place of Cheyenne, Wyoming, was there during the the festivals. It was, you know, just can't believe it unless you see it, the rodeo and all that. Mm -hmm. Then in San Antonio, Texas, you go see the Alamo and the Sunken Gardens. Uh, you read about it in school, but you don't believe it unless you see it. And when I was in Greenland, five and a half months of no daylight, complete darkness. Then five and a half months of no darkness, just complete daylight. Wow. I remember studying about that in school, and, and it's strange living it and seeing the northern lights. It's a beautiful sight. Mm -hmm. And you go to a place like Tully, and you believe it. You can't believe it existed because it's such an outcast. And when we were there, we were had an army outpost up on, on the mountain tops. And on a clear night, they could see the lights of Moscow. And uh, it was a strange place. When you left there, you were a little more, you say, a little older. Where was that at? Totally Air Force Base, I mean, because it's so isolated. Uh, they only have about three months they can get, or three weeks they can get ships and that into the place because everything freezes over so badly. And it was an experience, an experience I'll never forget. It made me more thankful for what we have here. Mm -hmm what I see there and you see how those Eskimos live up there. It's it's very hard to believe. The people do live that way. I guess God provides for them. And one strange thing we found out up there that if an Eskimo became ill, we couldn't give them the medicines that we take because their systems couldn't handle it. And they, they, it would be worse for them than if they handled it their way. And they had their own way of curing themselves. Mm -hmm. I guess God provided for them in their atmosphere because they were happy. <laughs> How about any mementos or souvenirs? Did you bring anything like that back with you? No. 
really there wasn't too much to bring back, you know. Uh, like I said, memories of the fellows that I served with up mm -hmm. there. Okay. What was your job assignment? Uh, I was in supplies and handled uh, all the supplies that came in by plane, by ship. We stored them in the warehouses. We, uh, provided supplies for those that <coughs> were needed. Uh, handled the food supplies for the base. We handled all the uh, supplies for the equipment that we used, the clothing for the servicemen were there. We operated the warehouses to make sure everybody had what they needed. Okay. Did you see combat? Uh, not real combat, no. We, we had, right up there and they put on a, uh, I guess they called it a rehearsal. They brought the 101st Airborne up and we went into a mock, uh, a mock invasion because they said that where we were, we were the last warning in case Russia came over with their planes that we would be the warning line for the United States and they had a mock uh, invasion with the 101st Airborne and it was interesting. Uh, and we're proud to be there. Proud to know that we were, we were doing. You know. Were there any casualties in your unit? Frostbite. But, uh, no, there were no casualties. We had uh, a couple of sprains, and, and I, but that, nothing, nothing serious. Okay. Did you sustain any type of injury? while you were in the service? Yes. Uh, when I was in San Antonio, Texas, I was coming back to the base in the car and another driver lost control of his car. He hit my car and I needed my back. And that's what caused me to be this because I had planned on making the career in the service. In fact, I had just re-enlisted for six years. And a few months after that, the accident happened, and the doctor told me he thought it would be best if I, I didn't have to do all the uh, working around the warehouses and that. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to send me to food service for them, and I told them no, that I didn't want that. <laughs> I came out of service and I ended up being a chef. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a prisoner of war? No. Do you want to share any of your experiences? Well, you weren't in captivity, so we don't need that question. I'm sorry. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Very good contact medal for service, you know, good service. Uh, no battle medals, because I wasn't in any battles. Can you share any battle planning with us? Well, they had they had a system of warning for the United States. We had, if we saw the Soviet planes coming over, they had a program worked out as to where we would notify the United States and we would put up whatever defense we could. And uh, they told us we had a life expectancy of about 15 minutes if that happened because uh, we had no major cannons. The Army, the Army post up above us had the heavy equipment. But down below, all we had were the carbines and, and things of that nature. We were there for a warning, and uh, we are proud to be there. You know, it was a strange place. I, it's hard to believe that that place existed. And the conditions under the GIs had to live up there, but it's, and they had civilian workers up there. And it's hard to believe those men volunteered to come up there, but they did, you know. And uh, I look back on it, I guess I'm thankful that I was there because I appreciate what I have here more. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, 
and see how those people live. And while we were there, we had people from other countries that were serving in our in the Air Force. And it was interesting to learn how their customs differed from ours. But it was all for the same thing, you know. It's all that's why they were in our Air Force trying to help their countries too, because they figured we were there to help their countries. And uh, it was interesting to meet these people and talk to these people. And some were pleasant, and some were very, had a very arrogant attitude because they blamed us for the problems their countries were having. You know. mm -hmm. But it was interesting, it was, it was a happy experience, it was a proud experience. And uh, a lot of the men I served with there had seen combat in other, other battles. And uh, it was a joy serving with him. Okay. How did you get along with the officers and fellow soldiers? Fine. It was, it was it was very comfortable atmosphere. We had some officers that are hard to deal with. But usually the men were very, very, uh, very cooperative. They were very personable. Uh, make friends with a lot of them. Uh, he did see the time when we partied, but you know we had a lot of friends, a mm -hmm. lot of good times together. We helped one another out, and of course we had some good good commanders, and we had some not so good commanders, but we, <laughs> you know, uh, all in all, it was a good personal black uh, atmosphere between, the, between all of us, you know. Okay. Uh, the officers were pretty, uh, usually very, very cooperative, very understanding with the service. Did you feel any pressure, stress, or anxiety during your term? No, uh, I was getting time to return from Green and the anxiety was leaving that place. <laughs> <laughs> Did you keep a personal diary? No. Can you tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences? We were in Greenland, seeing the northern lights was one of them. Uh, the other one was, they had a, a windstorm up there in the night, in the dark season, which is like our fall and we know you. Uh, that's when their windstorms come about. And they called them phase one, two, three. And we got caught in one of them. Outdoors in the phase two hit, and when the wind blows up there, you, you can't see your hands in front of your face. And there was oh, about a dozen men that were out there, and we were in two six fives, and we were trying to follow. Can you repeat that? We were a dozen men out there. There were a dozen men that were caught out in the windstorm. We were outdoors. And uh, we were in six bags and we were trying to follow one another. And finally we saw a light out in the distance and we didn't know what it was. And one of the trucks happened to hit a pole. And we all climbed out of the truck and formed like a human chain going for that light. It happened to be a mess hall. And we slept on the floor in the mess hall that night because we, we couldn't go back. And we were in some trouble because we shouldn't have been out there because he says we should have been back into a building uh, when the warning came. And every building up there has its own supply of, of food, 
uh, they call sea rations, enough to last you for two days in case you become carding on it. And we lived in warehouses for a couple of days, you know, sometimes. And of course, we had the animals up there. They had rabbits up there, the bigger than our dogs. <laughs> Snowshoe rabbits, they're, they're enormous. And they had dogs up there, they're very friendly to you. They tell you don't fall down in the dark because then you're no longer friendly because they figure you're you're a prey and they come after you. But uh, getting caught in that windstorm it was one of them seeing the northern lights and then going up on the mountain top where the army post was. We go up there and you have to go right up the face of the mountain. And you get up there, and it's it's like a different world up there. Those those fellas, I they they live. When I see the story Mash on television, it reminds me of that outpost up there, because that's what it reminds me of. And when the windstorms come, they they have it worse than we do, because they're on the mountain top. They, they could, like they said, they'd go out on a clear night in November and they could see the lights in Moscow. And it's a beautiful place. You know, we go out, uh, one of the pilots up there was a friend of my brother's. He took me up in the helicopter, took me out over the ice cap. Oh, that's a beautiful sight. It's a deadly thing, but it's a beautiful sight. While we were up there, they said that our government was trying to dig a tunnel through the ice cap. Our government and the Danish government were trying to dig a tunnel through the ice cap to connect where we were to the southern tip of Greenland. The ice cap was so strong they couldn't do it. It was just dying, understand the ice cap was melting. At that time, it was it was something. And it, it's going up in that helicopter and seeing that out there, that was a beautiful sight. That's something I won't forget. Were you able to stay in touch with your family? Oh yes, they had a they had a ham radio system up there. They had ham radio volunteers in the stateside between there and stateside, and. We would talk, we could talk to our family. They would talk on their phone here, but it would come over to him radio up there. And uh, on the holidays, they, they set aside times where each of us could call our families and talk to our families. Said, yeah, we could talk to our families, but it had to be by ham radio. You had six different people listening to what you were saying because <laughs> they were, but it was, it was nice. We thankful that there were people there that, cared enough to do that. Mm -hmm. But by phone, no, we couldn't do it by phone because there was no no other way than him ready to go. Were there letters? Were you able to send letters? Uh, the airplanes came in when the air cleared, they came in once in a while with mail. Yeah, we were, we were able to send mail. Did you do or have something special for good luck? <clears throat> Yeah, I, to this day, I don't know what happened to it. But I had a, a special picture in the rabbit foot that I kept with me. During all the times I moved and I lost it somewhere. But, but every time I had problems coming up, I'd hold on to them. Of course, I had a picture of Jesus that was with me all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did a lot of talking to him up there. <laughs> <laughs> did you have plenty of supplies? Yeah, but the supplies up there are different what we need to do, <clears throat> especially the food. Uh, up there you ate, instead of eating eggs, you ate powdered eggs. You had powdered milk, nothing fresh up there. 
very, very rare and you see fresh vegetables and fresh things up there, except in the day season when they, they could get in. But uh, yeah, everything was like, it was in a powdered form, it was dried and dehydrated and we made it up there and put it in water and it, but uh, it was, it was, uh, that's why I say being back here makes me thankful for what I have because I know what we had to eat up there. And it was like eating sea rations all the time. Mm -hmm. How did you entertain yourself? Fellas with guitars, musical instruments, listening to the radio. They had a radio station up there that was on 24 hours a day. We had uh, some USO shows come in. Bob Pope came in one time when we were up there. And there was a few big USO shows, and they had movies for us to go to, you know. And they had. Uh, gyms where we could go and work out. So next question is, were there any entertainers that came to see your units? You say Bob Hope? Yeah, some USO shows came up. Bob Hope and different other USO shows came up and entertained us. Uh, he's the one that's most memorable. There are other, others that came up and they would come up every so often and entertain us. Like I said, we had movies, we had the uh, radio station went on. They, the radio station kept us pretty well up to date as to what was happening here. Mm -hmm. And every now and then we'd have uh, Muscle and Marley come over with the radio and tell us what we were doing on tour and you know, kind of shook us up a little bit that she would know that. She talked to us and warned us up there. You know, uh, and who was that again? Moscow Marley. Moscow Marley? Marley. Moscow Marley. Marley. Okay. She okay. came on. It was like Tokyo Road during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. It just was Moscow Marley. Okay. She'd come on and tell us what we were doing on Tour of Air Force Base, screaming, you know, all what that we were doing a mistake being that we shouldn't be there, that we had to leave because they were going to annihilate us, you know. But, uh, that shakes you up a little bit, but you say what's going to happen is going to happen. What did you do when you were on leave? Went home to see the family. Uh, had good family get-togethers, met with friends, went out with friends. Uh, when I came back from dinner and I told my friends, be thankful for what you have here because what, uh, what they have in other places is not as good as what we have here. You know. uh, and met with some of the fellows that I was stationed with, met with some of the families of the servicemen I was stationed went to meet the families and say hello to them. And it was a joy meeting them and it was a joy being back here. Uh, seeing my family. Because mm -hmm. uh, I had brothers that were off in different parts of the world in the service. You know, and uh, we kept in communication with one another. We joined, we came home and we could all be together again. But we came home and celebrated our time with our families and with our friends and did, enjoyed the country. Did you travel while you were in the service? Uh, yeah, we traveled some. We went from uh, state to state. We were in Wyoming. We went to see the sites up there. In New York, uh, we went to uh, New York City, we went to Radio City Music Hall. We were going to go out to the Statue of Liberty, but I mean, just too big of a crowd going that way. So we went to uh, New York. Uh, some of the people didn't like the service. I was in there, some other people, they thought we were lazy bums. But other people were completely different. We went to a restaurant in New York. We sat down, we ordered our meal. 
They brought us the check. We went to pay it. The chef walked over and picked him up. He says, I've got a son in service. He said, this one's on me. We went to Radio City Music Hall. We checked in. We went to pay. And he says, yeah, you're in uniform. He said, it's half price for you. And other people, uh, when we were at Samson Air Force Base, we had restaurants and hotels up there, had signs in them. No dogs or human around. No. But uh, they made close Sam's and they went to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. And those people that had those signs complained the loudest of anybody because we were leaving. But usually, people are very friendly to the service. Uh, but a lot of them come into their towns, you know, like San Antonio, Texas. I think they had three big military bases there, right in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a good time. It was, it was, we went to see the sights there. I would go around San Antonio, we'd go out into the country and see, you know, when you watch your cowboy movies, you'd see the country. And we went out into the country and, and around there, and you'd be surprised how much it really is like what you see in the movies. Uh, but you learn different customs, you learn different rules you have to follow because certain things you do, you're going to get in trouble. Back when we were in, in San Antonio, they told us we walked out around the ranch, a big ranch or something, and you saw a black snake or a garden snake, you better not hurt it. Because if you hurt it, the farmers are going to get angry with you because they use it to kill the rodents on the farms and that. And if you walk by and don't have a pair of wire cutters in your pocket, because if you're going to wrestle their cattle, then it's it's nothing mean. It's just the rule they have amongst themselves, you know. And uh, they're really friendly people. We went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and met a couple down there. It was the grandfather of one of our fellow servicemen in San Antonio. He had beehives. And this man would let the bees get on his hand and he'd sting them. His fingers would just fall off. But uh, we went down there and, and they had a custom. We went there on a Saturday evening. Sunday morning, we woke up, did all the chores. Went to have a cup of coffee or something. And the grandmother says, No, go to church before we do anything. So we got dressed and went to church. Went to church and they introduced us and everybody welcomed us to town, you know. And that, that made me feel kind of strange because here I am a stranger, you know, and they're welcoming me to town. And uh, we went back home and she cooked a meal. She made homemade biscuits with her homemade honey. I had never tasted food that <laughs> But I'm a coffee drinker, and they make coffee, that Louisiana coffee. I, I couldn't handle that stuff. I had chicory in it, man. That was too strong for me. You know. But then she made regular coffee. But it was, we met the people down there, and they were very friendly, very welcoming, very outgoing people. Mm -hmm. You go into their town, and they welcome you with open arms. And I found that most of the places I went. Other than Utica, New York, but some of the people up there were the same way. But I understand that in Utica because some of the airmen brought it on themselves. Go out and get all drunken up, and then all of a sudden they cause problems. But all in all, the people I found were very, very pleasant to us. Very, it, it, that's what made it an honor to serve for them because we knew they appreciated it and they welcomed it. And many of them had already served for us and they went to battle for us. You know, it's like with people I see here. Uh, it's really an honor to listen to some of the stories they tell of what they went through. In fact, we got one fellow in our, in our ward wrote a book about his, his uh, times over there. And it's a good book, it's a good reading. It's 
great guy, you know. We talked to him. It's a real honor to see what these guys went through. You know, being prisoners of war, being mm -hmm. and all. And I only wish our people in Washington would appreciate more what these guys do for us and what they're still doing for us. What were some of the pranks that you or others would pull? Did you ever pull a prank? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were in Greenland, especially when, you know, when it's 24 hours daylight and 24 hours darkness. And on daylight season, we were working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, yeah, I come in, go to sleep. Then sleep for a couple of hours, go shake my hand, you wait for life to work, and you jump up and get dressed and go to work. Find out they're about eight hours too early you now. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we, we do that. We, we pull up short beds. Uh, short sheet the beds? take the ship and <clears throat> fold it over and they try to get in it and they can't because they're holding the top and it needs but uh, we had a lot of times our people would be dating girls from town and go out to dances and everything Someone would act like they're trying to steal the buddy's girlfriend or, you know, like just playing games with him, you know. But it was, uh, we had a good time. We played games, give somebody a cup of coffee and put a shot of whiskey in it, you know, without them knowing it. Do you recall the day your service ended? Yes. <clears throat> the saddest days of my life because I was in the hospital and I wanted to make a career of my service and the doctor told me no that wouldn't happen so they gave me service disability and I came out of service you know. and I came home and it's very difficult to find employment to adjust to the it's difficult to adjust to civilian life after you come out of the service. And especially when you're on a disability because employers don't want to, kind of don't want to be bothered with you. But uh, I had a good family, good friends. And uh, they made it a lot more pleasant. Did you resume a job of any kind or start a new career? Yes, start a new career. <coughs> I <clears throat> worked in a no okay, care. I went in. I hired myself as I went in as a dishwasher. As I was a dishwasher, I kept learning more and more, and I finally became a cook. And I learned different phases of cooking. I went to the Hilton Hotel. As a sausage chef, I left the Hilton Hotel and I went into management. And that's what brought me to Quincy. I uh, was a food manager. And the company I worked for operated the food service at St. Mary, the old St. Mary's mm -hmm. Hospital. And he asked me in 69, he says, we need help out there when you go out there for six months and we'll bring you back. And, uh, okay. And I had just gotten married about a year before that. And I said, okay. So I came out here. And after about three months, the associate administrator at St. Mary's told my company, when you take John out of here, pack your things up and leave. So I've been here ever since. <laughs> and I was the director over there for 21 years. We were really? Right. I the nutrition service over there for about 21 years. And I left there and they made a blessing. 
this and brought them out. But that was a fantastic time working there. I should sure get some dedicated wonderful people there. You know. uh, some of the employees that work for me, some of the people that work for me, they and I really met people from different walks of life. You know. And I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed working with them. I enjoyed helping people. I enjoyed doing what I did. Uh, and I left the hospital and I drove school bus for a year and I went to work at the rich restaurant. I wrote rich restaurant for about two and a half years and I retired. And, uh, but I enjoyed Quincy. Quincy, I grew up in a little town of Pennsylvania called Moonline, Pennsylvania. It's about 11 miles outside of Pittsburgh. And it's just about like Quincy. And that's why when I came here, I fell in love with Quincy. I fell in love with the people. Because the attitude here is so much different than back east. You know, I walked into St. Mary's Hospital and saw all them school students working there, and I said, oh, what did I get myself into? Because working with students in the back are a completely different, different attitude. I come out of here and I saw them and I said, oh boy, I'm in trouble. But I found out some of the most wonderful students, some of the most cooperative kids I've ever worked with, and made good friends with all of them. My wife came out here and we used to have household kids every night, and especially on weekends, they'd be at our place, we'd have parties and that. Uh, never anything wrong, we always had good times, Play jokes on one another. We play games. We talk, and uh, it was fun. And the parents, some of them still tell me today. In fact, some of the people working here are relatives of the people that used to work for. Them. Wow! And it's uh, I really enjoy them. Uh, in fact, we used to do the consulting work here for food service when I was over there. But it's, uh, yeah, I learned a new trade. I learned uh, how to manage people. I learned what it took to manage people. That when you manage people, when you go to discipline your people, you gotta think, what, what would I do if that were me? How would what I'm going to say sound to me if I was the one doing it? And uh, we had a lot of students that came from problem homes, and we worked with them, we brought them out. That's, that's what made me the proudest. Uh, but the students that I worked with, People that I work with really dedicated, loving, caring people. Not only in, in my department, but the nurses, the doctors. You know. And they made me think what I went through in the service was worthwhile. Because I see what, what's here, what we have here, and how the people feel here. And I realize when I talk to people from other countries, they want the same thing we do. It's not us they're mad at. It's not them we're mad at. But, uh, yeah, I had some wonderful, wonderful memories of the, of the job I had, of the management, managing people. Gives you a whole different outlook <laughs> of what it takes, you know, what people are like. Mm-hmm. Did you make any close friendships while you were in the service? Oh, yes. Uh, I had one fellow from uh, Alaska, one from Oklahoma, an Indian, an Indian. I had an Indian friend. We were going to become blood brothers. We decided against it. <laughs> 
because the servers not the idea was cutting our hands. Uh, I had friends from Mississippi. We had one boy from Mississippi never saw snow. He saw snow in San Antonio and went crazy. Couldn't believe what snow looked like. But uh, yeah, we, we developed a lot of good friends. And some of them, uh, of course, most of them are gone now. We've lost no touch with most of them. We had some good friends. Uh, and we visited with one another at times. Did you ever attend a reunion of any kind? But then, no, we were too scattered at. We never had a reunion because the servers, the people were out with, were, were, uh, we were in a battle unit. We were, we were a different unit to just mm -hmm. spread out all over the place. We didn't have any. Did you ever join a veterans organization of any type? Yes. I belong to the American Legion. I support the BFWM. Yeah, but I'm a member of the American Legion. Has your service and experiences affected your life? Yes. It made me more thankful for what I have. It made me uh, understand people a lot more. It made me have an attitude like if I want you to like me, I've got to like you. And I've got to understand you if I want you to understand me. And sometimes when you talk to people, you've got to say things the way you want to hear them. Sometimes we say things that uh, when you say them, you just say, Oh, I wish I could have taken that back, or it's too late. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of good times, a lot of uh, rough times. And we learned then how to connect with one another, how to communicate with one another. Because once we learn someone else's attitude, what's bothering them, what's, what they're all about, then you learn how to communicate with them. Has anyone ever thanked you for serving your country? And if so, how did it make you feel? Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, every time. Somebody comes up and says, thank you for serving the country. I feel good, but I feel more thankful for those guys that were in the battlefield. I wasn't on any battlefield. I was, I was in an outpost, but I never had to fire any weapons at anybody. I never had to have anybody firing weapons at me. I was never a prisoner of war, and I'm so thankful to these fellows you know, that were when they went through that. And are still the wonderful people they are. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or military in general? Yes. Yes. I feel wars are unnecessary. I feel that there's nobody who wins a war. Nobody. Even the victors are the losers. Uh, we won the Second World War. But look what it cost us. Uh, I feel that more good could be done if I sat down across the table and we compromised with one another. Nobody has to get killed, nobody loses. But greed does strange things to people. And that's what this is all about. Somebody wanting what somebody else has, or killed to get it. But yeah, wars to me are unnecessary and they're useless.
Will you encourage young men and women to enlist today? From being, from being. Feelings that I had, from the, the experiences that I had. Yes. I said, go ahead and enlist. And it, it makes you feel good that you're serving the country. Uh, if we don't protect it, nobody is. So yeah, I'd encourage anybody that has the opportunity, go ahead and enlist. No matter what you walk in life, you get a whole different outlook on life once you're in the military and you see what it takes to protect this country. And you see the people you're protecting. That's what makes it worthwhile when you meet and see the people you're protecting. And, you know, they're doing the same thing for you. So, yeah, I would encourage anybody to do this. It's okay. wonderful to me. Is your view of government the same before and after your your years of service? No. <laughs> no. I feel the biggest betrayal of our military people is our government. They send them out to fight. They get wounded, then when they come back, they're not willing to pay the bill for it. We keep getting letters in the mail support your wounded, you know, help support your wounded. Uh, I figured this government should quit betraying the service man. You realize what the service man is all about. And what surprises me is that many of them have been in war. Many of them have been gone. gone. They've sat the foxholes. They, they fought the battles. Yet here they come back and they betrayed the very reason they fought for. Yeah, in my view of government is they need to replace them all. How do you feel about how war is depicted in movies? I think they had to quit making the looks of climbers. Uh, I think they had a little words. They had to make it look like the deadly thing that it really is. Uh, the cool, simple thing that it is. That war doesn't accomplish anything except destroy property and destroy the eyes. What is your opinion of war history taught in school today? I think if they taught in schools the histories and the destruction the wars caught, caused, and in the upcoming generations would do everything in their power to avoid not only in this country, but in all countries. Uh, you see the countries that are fighting these wars, the people are starving. Look what's happening to us with the wars we're fighting. I remember when I was growing up, we went into the Second World War. You had to have stamps to buy anything. You were limited on what kind of, how much milk you could have, how much gasoline, bread you could buy. Uh, that's what war does. See, and that's, that's what it's doing today. It's, it's costing the government money that should go into educating our, our youngsters, into building programs to make people's lives better rather than spending it on these destructive things we're into. If the people in other countries want to have civil wars, let them fight it out. You know, let's stay here and protect our people, give our people what they deserve. And it's not what we're doing. We're, we're over there supporting the rich and the evil rather than protecting and serving ourselves. What's the most positive thing you took away from your experience in the service? People's willingness to love one another, to help one another. Uh, I 
I have seen people that would go out of their way to help the servicemen if they need a service, needed help. I have seen servicemen go out of their way to help people. I I see these toys for cats that come up from the servicemen. It's their love for one another. And I I I do feel that if our government sat down and looked at that and used that same type of thinking, they said we're not gonna fight the wars, we're not gonna be any wars unless it comes to us. If it comes to us time we'll protect ourselves. But if those other people wanna fight their wars, it's not pay for it, because that's what we're doing. Uh, it's very costly to everything. It's costly to the people that are here. It's costly to the people that are coming home from the wars that are wounded. They're being denied the treatment they deserve. Many of them coming home are uh, disturbed psychologically, injured psychologically. I don't mean to say they're crazy. But war does strange things to strange people. I know I had a brother that went to war and he had a nervous breakdown. And most times he was the most fantastic brother he could have. Certain things would trigger him off and when he did, he just cleared out of his way because you know, he kind of went berserk with anger. He wouldn't hurt anybody, he didn't want to hurt anybody. But uh, they need to be treated. So and that's what's happening today. These these kids are deploying over to Afghanistan and Iraq. And they're seeing the killings and the torture that's going on. That affects you. I know when I sit and watch television, I watch people or animals being beaten and, and tortured. It affects me. I can imagine how that affects those people that are seeing it in real life right there and are a part of it. And I don't know what it's like to have to pull the trigger and kill somebody. I don't know if I can live with that. But if it's necessary, you know, that's what these, these children are living with, these people. I'm, not, I'm saying children. Uh, they're children when they go in, but when they come out, they're men. But that, that feeling stays with them. It's got to be cured. And our government's just not willing to do that. And that's a shame. This is my last question. Is there anything you would like to add as an overview to this um, interview that you'd like to state to the camera? Yes. I would like to say let's all pray for peace. Let's all work for peace. Let's all work with our government tell them enough's enough. You know, quit spending money on war and start spending it on your people. Because the people are what deserve it. Instead of spending money on war, spend it on educating the children. Because that's where our future is. If you don't if you don't educate your youngsters and you're taking it away from them. Every time your schools are cutting back because a government agencies won't finance them. I think that should be their priority. Finance every every piece of education you have. And my one one suggestion, and I know people are telling me I'm crazy for this. Make the Bible a textbook in every school. I think that would help end all this cool and all this war. But that won't happen. I know that won't happen because they figure you got to separate God from the state. That can't be. Because every human being alive, no matter where they are or who they are, whether they believe it or not, lives their lives, every second of their lives is under two rules. Rules of God and rules of man. And when the two conflict, the rule of God has got to do, got to rule, got to win. And uh, I just don't think our government's ready to do that. But that's what it's going to take. Thank you. Thank you.